Good morning. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, on behalf of Ola, thank you for uh, joining us today for our second event in our four-part series uh, to examine the Trump administration's Latin America policy and its consequences for human rights and democracy in the region. Uh, I am delighted today to be joined by uh, my colleagues and experts from the U.S. and the region to discuss a very important topic on corruption and the rule of law. Uh, we're joined today by Claudia Paz y Paz, uh, who probably doesn't need any introduction. Um, she is currently the director for Mexico and Central America at the Center for Justice and International Law Sahil and is the former attorney general of Guatemala. Bienvenida, Claudia. Uh, Michael Camilleri, who's the director of the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. And we're hoping that uh, Gustavo Gorrite, Gorriti, who's the director of IDL Reporteros, um, an independent investigative media outlet based in Peru, will be able to join us later for the discussion. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody that we do have simultaneous translation, so you can select uh, which language you would prefer at the bottom of your screen. Um, and please do send in questions during the event uh, by using the hashtag Wola Taking Stock and tagging uh, Wola on Twitter. I uh, also want to remind everybody not to miss uh, our other two events, which will look at uh, the threats to dem democracy and closing of civic spaces in the region and the issue of uh, human mobility and migration um, that will take place next Wednesday and the following Wednesday at the same time at 11 um, Eastern time. So just to begin, um, as we know, in the past decade, uh, we've seen uh, high profile corruption scandals across the, reg the region, which have increased citizens demand for greater transparency and accountability. Uh, in some cases, this has led uh, to presidents um, being elected on the promise that they're going to fight and root out corruption. We've seen important judicial actions and the creation of innovative international mechanisms um, such as uh, CCG in Guatemala and Maxi in Honduras. Yet as these efforts you know, began to produce uh, results, we also saw a very strong backlash uh, from political elites, corrupt actors, both within and outside of government. Um, and we're starting to see a backstepping on many of those promises and efforts to combat corruption and strengthen the rule of law. Across the region, we've seen how actors are jeopardizing the independence of the judiciary, politicizing the election of judges. We've seen how legislatures have you know, attempted or adopted policies um, that are trying to limit uh, the ability to hold corrupt actors accountable. And we've seen attacks and defamation campaigns against journalists, civil society actors, independent judges and prosecutors who have tried to protect the rule of law and supported anti-corruption efforts. Uh, amidst all this, we've also seen that, you know, the Trump administration, rather than strongly condemn this backlash, has emboldened political leaders and their allies to dismantle these anti-corruption efforts and weaken the independence of the judiciary. Um, so I guess to begin, you know, our discussion today and to set the framework, I want to start with you, Michael. I know you've written a lot about these issues um, and looked at them across the region. I wanted to ask if you could provide us with a brief overview of where the region stands in its anti-corruption efforts. Why has it been so difficult uh, for the region to tackle this um, central issue for so many decades? Thanks, Adriana. Buenos dias uh, a todas y a todos. Uh, great to great organizing the session. Really an honor to participate and to to do so alongside uh, you, Adriana and Claudia and, and Gustavo. Hopefully, who are uh, three of my heroes in, in terms of uh, uh, the anti-corruption fight in in the region. Um, so, uh, you know the the. You know, the question you asked, how is Latin America doing uh, in combating corruption? I, I mean, I think the answer is not very well, <laughs> um, with a few exceptions. Um, and that's actually probably the same answer I would have given a few years ago. Um, the difference maybe is that a few years ago, I would have said the region is trending in the right direction. And now, unfortunately, uh, I'd argue that most of the trend lines are negative. And, and you mentioned some of this, Adriana, so I'll, I'll tread, I think, similar ground. Uh, but I'll try to unpack it a little bit as a basis 
uh, for our conversation. So um, needless to say, corruption is a, a perennial challenge uh, in, in many countries in Latin America, in some places an endemic challenge. Um, the causes of this are, you know, range from the the historic, you know, ones that can be traced back to the colonial administration, which I'll, I'll, I'll spare uh, our audience uh, and not get into. Others, uh, other causes are, are thoroughly kind of modern, uh, including the, the penetration of the state by uh, organized crime, for example. Um, uh, but I think most uh, kind of rigorous analyses of the state of corruption in the region, and we could, you know, point to the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index as, as, as perhaps the the gold standard, you know, they paint a pretty familiar uh, and, and fairly disheartening picture. Uh, typically, three countries, Chile, Uruguay, and Costa Rica, get positive scores, uh, and the rest of the region fails. Uh, and there is uh, there's variation within the, re the region. Um, Venezuela inevitably kind of uh, brings up the, the, you know, the, is at the bottom of the pile. Um, but the, 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 the picture is not a, a particularly good one when you look at the region as a whole. Um, the causes of, of this, I think, are worth mentioning, and they're, they're immense um, from an economic perspective, from the, the perspective of uh, government services and citizen welfare, including, uh, obviously, in the, in the context of the current pandemic, and from the perspective of democratic governance. I think you see in the, in the recent Latino Barometro surveys, for example, a, a really disturbing decline uh, in citizen faith and democracy, which, which I tie um, directly to to some of the the corruption scandals and trends that we've seen in recent years um so you know broadly speaking again i think that the pervasiveness and the pr principal modalities of corruption in the region uh, have not changed uh, much in the last four years but what has changed is the sense that we're moving in the right direction so uh, if you had taken a snapshot of the region say three or four years ago and adriana you mentioned some of this you would have seen mobilized civil societies and public protests in many countries. You would have seen highly innovative hybrid mechanisms functioning with considerable success in Guatemala and to, to a lesser extent in Honduras. You would have seen presidents and, and business executives going to jail as part of the largest, uh, kind of the, an unprecedented transnational corruption investigation spanning 10 countries. You would have seen serious efforts, I think most notably perhaps in Chile, to look at the preventive side of anti-corruption uh, by adopting far-reaching reforms in vulnerable areas like political finance. And, and you would have seen the most important multilateral forum in the Americas, the Summit of the Americas, focused on the theme of combating corruption. Uh, now, I don't think all of this momentum has been lost. Uh, we continue to see courageous prosecutors and investigative journalists working hard to uncover and punish corruption. Uh, in some cases, the institutional innovations of the last decade or two have proven resilient and effective. Um, uh, and recent surveys show that even in the midst of a global pandemic, corruption remains near the top of citizen concerns uh, in many countries in the region. Uh, and I don't think governments will be able to ignore that. Uh, but at the same time, it's clear that the situation has changed. The sense of momentum has, has dissipated uh, and some countries are clearly backsliding. Adriana, you've, you've spoken recently, for example, about the penal code reforms in Honduras, which seem actually designed to benefit corrupt politicians and shield them uh, from corruption investigations. So that's, you know, just to take kind of one example. Um, so, you know, just to, to, to end here, I mean, what has happened? What, what, uh, what explains the, the kind of loss of momentum and, and the loss of the sense that we were at least trending in the right direction? Um, I'm sure there's lots of things we could throw out, but let me just mention sort of three things to, to start the conversation. Um, the first is, uh, you know, we had a series of, of pretty consequential elections in the region, and those elections brought change, in some case, pretty radical change, um, but not necessarily change for the better. Um, corruption scandals, as they typically do, sparked a backlash against incumbent parties, uh, against sitting presidents, uh, and against the kind of conventional uh, political class more broadly. Um, that allowed um, political outsiders who ran against the political establishment to um, kind of tap into this citizen sentiment and, and, and ride that to power. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the leaders who did this most effectively, the, the Bolsonaro's and the AMLO's and the Bukele's and the Jimmy Morales's, um, you know, they, they talked a good game on anti-corruption. Uh, but once they got into office, they did not uh, turn out to be um, any more effective in combating corruption in most cases, and in, in some cases actually were were significantly worse. Um, so we don't have, unfortunately, a, a crop of political leaders who has who has um, 
kind of su successfully, I think, um, harnessed the anti-corruption movement um, for effective reform. Um, the second thing, as you mentioned, Adriana, is the backlash. Um, what we've seen is that corrupt networks and interests are very resilient, uh, including in the face of scandals, prosecutions, arrests. Um, this is very clear, I think, if you look at the cases of Honduras and Guatemala, uh, in the way that political and economic elites uh, close ranks uh, to successfully expel Sisig and Masi, um, and to systematically attack the domestic institutions that were leading the anti-corruption fight. Uh, and then the final thing, and this, I think, links us to, to the theme of today's discussion, is the Trump administration. Uh, I, I don't think we should overstate this, but I also don't think we should understate it. Um, it is undeniable, I think, that at, at some critical junctures, the Trump administration has either not prioritized or has actively undermined efforts to combat corruption and, and uphold the rule of law. And, and, you know, Exhibit A here may be, in fact, the uh, abandonment uh, at, at a really critical moment of CC in Guatemala, which had for over a decade, and, and Claudia and, and you, Adriana, know this better than anyone, had enjoyed significant, you know, pers per, you know persistent kind of bipartisan support uh, in the United States, including uh, at the beginning of the Trump administration. Um, but that was that was very quickly kind of um, abandoned and, and undermined and, and allowed uh, Guatemala uh, kind of gave gave the Guatemalan government cover uh, to to end CCIG's mandate. Uh, and in doing so, uh, and what had been, I think, uh, a really standout um, uh, innovative uh, experiment in, in, in uh, seeing the international community really buttress and ally with the domestic institutions in a Latin American country uh, to take on corrupt networks. Um, so let me stop there as a, a kind of an opening assessment of where we are and look forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, a lot to unpack there. Claudia, Michael mentioned varias veces um, las experiencias de Guatemala. Well, Claudia, we've heard about uh, the experience from uh, Guatemala and Honduras, and also the work conducted by CICIG and MASIG. And what we've seen is that the governments of Guatemala and Honduras have weakened and undermined the CICIG mandate. In the case of uh, Guatemala, the same with Honduras. In the case of El Salvador. And also President Bukele promised a commission to fight corruption. And so far, we haven't seen them meet these goals. How would you describe the current situation to combat corruption currently? Thank you, Adriana, for your question and for the invite to share the current situation in these three countries and their fight against corruption and impunity. For me, it's a great honor to be here with Michael and yourself and hopefully with Gustavo as well. I think that, well, I have to say I concur with everything that has been asserted already. In Honduras and Guatemala, we are undergoing unfathomable realities in terms of the strengthening of the justice system, reduction of impunity, fight against corruption. Well, in Guatemala, there were many inroads made against uh, former President Perez Molina, the cabinet that was uh, also, well, it had uncovered some corruption. And then we had the first lady in Honduras that was investigated by Maxi. I think that these were signs that uh, through political will and sustained efforts of the national institutions and uh, international community, well, this fight would be fruitful as we fought against impunity and for transparency, that that could come to fruition with that political will. But unfortunately, I feel that both experiments fell short both Maxi and Sisig 
they were victims of their own success because this alliance between economic elites, corrupt economic elites, and the political corrupt elites, well, that was more deep-seated and more powerful than we expected. And then both Sisig, well, with Sisig, first they expelled the commissioner, and with Maxi, they allowed for the mandate to expire without renewing it. Now, what have what do we have left in Guatemala and Honduras? I think in Guatemala, the situation is very particular because in spite of the fact that they removed the CICIG, and even though they have a majority in parliament, in spite of the Supreme Court of Justice, well, unfortunately, is working in cahoots with these uh, pro-impunity institutions. And in spite of the uh, linkages to those uh, forces that want to go back to where they had greater power and access, and li well, limitless access to public funds for their own benefit and not the benefit of the people. Well, in spite of all of that, I think that thanks to honest judges and prosecutors, honest ombudsmen and women, we see that uh, this with uh, independent advocates of human rights and journalists, we have not seen a setback in cases that had already been presented. That notwithstanding, it's only because of these people's commitment and efforts to fight for justice and against corruption and to great cost to them because they're being stigmatized and uh, they are being threatened in terms of uh, being uh, destituted. We have uh, some threats to remove them. And uh, with the Supreme Court of Justice in the midst of it. So even though we have not yet had a setback, it has carried an enormous cost as it has uh, really lay waste to their positions. And uh, however, we have seen that we need greater support from the international community because they are the last link in this very weak rule of law. Now, this setback was also witnessed in Honduras. Just this week, there was a resolution where they ordered some uh, orders against, uh, well, there was a warrant issued against uh, the First Lady. And uh, without the public ministry reacting to it as expected, well, they, these, uh, the warrant continued and uh, she, there was a warrant for her detention. And then we also have some campaigns that are being waged that make all their work very difficult as they try to do this. Well, Sisi doesn't have the strength that it had in its outset. And uh, even with the UN's support, well, they have not been able to thrive as much, not even Masig, which was enjoying the backing of the OAS. However, they have enjoyed some accompanying. And uh, I think that it, after a year of its creation, I think that uh, they need to render a report of what they have been doing because in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras, there has been a clear mismanagement of funds, especially during the pandemic. So we need to strengthen the health systems in order to have better medication procurements. So right now, I think that in order for them to enjoy greater transparency and credibility, they should render a report to demonstrate what they've been done. And just as any investigative 
institution, they need to provide that accountability and also what cases have been taken before justice where there has been a misuse of public funds because it has been already reported by independent mechanisms. And that's all I have to say on that, Adriana. Thank you, Claudia. Before we continue. Getting on, so we are trying to fix it. So hopefully he'll be able to join, but um, uh, we'll see if we can resolve them. Um, so, you know, moving forward, um, and you've raised, you know, the issue of political support, of momentum, of commitment. Uh, Michael, you also, um, in your initial remarks, talked about uh, the role of the Trump administration. So I wanted to unpack that a little bit more uh, because for decades we had, as you had mentioned, enjoyed strong bipartisan support uh, for these global anti-corruption efforts. Um, but under this administration, you do see that that you know, whole of government support has weakened. At times the president has praised uh, corrupt leaders abroad and his own actions um, you know, have raised multiple concerns uh, for defying constitutional, legal and ethical norms. Um, so to unpack that a little bit, you know, based on your experience of looking at these issues regionally, um, what have been you know, some of the impacts of you know, the United States stepping back on efforts to tackle corruption um, in the situation in Latin America? Um, and for you, Claudia, I guess if you can raise that um, more or unpack it, how it has impacted the situation uh, more specifically in, in Central America. Yeah, thank, thanks, Adriana. Um, yeah, Joe Biden, uh, who, who's in the news a little bit uh, these days, he's, uh, he's fond of saying that U.S. leadership is based uh, not on the example of U.S. power, but on the power of the U.S.'s example. Uh, and I, I've always found that's, uh, you know, especially true perhaps in Latin America, just given kind of the history uh, of the U.S. in the region. Um, and so I, I want to start um, my response to your question by actually looking at, at some of the things that have happened domestically, which obviously, you know, go well beyond the scope of this, this conversation. Uh, but I think it's, it, you know, it, it is important to start there. Um, and, and that record, I think, from this administration is one of uh, kind of ignoring or, or systematically weakening um, transparency and oversight bodies such as the Office of Government Ethics, um, the Inspector Generals. It's a record of defying long-held norms of presidential behavior, such as relax, uh, releasing tax uh, returns or divesting from investments that pose potential conflicts of interest. Uh, it, it's a record of potential violations of the Constitution's Foreign Emoluments Clause, uh, of stonewalling investigations by congressional committees and the courts, of steering millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in taxpayer money to the president's own businesses, uh, and ultimately of becoming just the third U.S. president in history to be impeached uh, and be impeached for trying to extort a foreign leader to do him a, a political favor by illegally withholding foreign assistance that was authorized by Congress. Um, now, why do I think that matters? Um, you know, obviously it matters to us as, uh, you know, those of us who are U.S. citizens, but um, in terms of foreign policy and, and the impacts kind of on, on the broader region, I think what this means in practical terms is that uh, even when U.S. diplomats say the right things about uh, corruption and rule of law um, and, and reflect that, that bipartisan consensus that, that you mentioned, Adriana, they are undermined by the lack of credibility and the inconsistency uh, of the administration they serve. Uh, and this is unfortunate because I think you just still do see um, U.S. officials at the working level trying to do and say the right things. Um, you know, just yesterday, Mike Kozak, the assistant secretary, uh, for the Western Hemisphere, released a really strong statement about the the Martinelli sons, who are you know trying to use part of the same immunity of all things to try to block their extradition to the U.S. to face uh, corruption charges. Uh, last month, we saw the Trump administration impose sanctions against Gustavo Alejos in, in Guatemala as, as he tries to uh, 
uh, you know, corruptly um, interfere with the integrity of the judicial selection process in that country. So, um, you know, we see um, some of the machinery uh, of anti-corruption um, that's been built up over over the past couple of decades still working in some cases. But these actions are, are I think, largely overshadowed and undermined by the administration's broader ambivalence uh, and politicization of rule of law issues. So we hear a lot about corruption and rule of law and human rights abuses in Venezuela and Cuba uh, and Nicaragua. Uh, and to be clear, th these are countries that fully deserve the, the criticism uh, of their abysmal human rights records. Um, but I think the credibility of that critique is undermined when the governments that are allied with the Trump administration are given a pass. Uh, and, you know, to, to take one example, when the administration continues to support um, a Honduran president, even after he becomes an unindicted co-conspirator in the drug trafficking prosecution of his brother. Um, and of course, if we look beyond the Americas, we see numerous examples of the administration providing unstinting and uncritical support to strong men in places like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey and the Philippines and elsewhere. Um, so, um, you know, I think the, the, the danger here ultimately is that the, dam the damage to U.S. credibility uh, and capacity to advance the rule of law internationally um, could be lasting and could, could last well beyond the Trump administration itself. Um, you know, the critique you, you hear from countries like Russia and China that uh, seek to undermine the international human rights project and movement is that this movement is not underpinned by universal values, but actually is just a vehicle for, um, uh, for a Western political agenda. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the Trump administration feeds this critique with a, a transparently ideological selectivity uh, in its defense of the rule of law, uh, both in the Americas and beyond. And, and I do worry that that will have a lasting impact and take, uh, take, take much time to, uh, to unwind and correct. Thank you, Michael. Um, bienvenido, Gustavo. Welcome, Gustavo. I'm glad. Full issues. Um, I will, uh, Claudia. Hola, I don't Claudia. know. Hola, Michael. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to go ahead and answer, Claudia, and then I will go to Gustavo and give him a very broad question, so we can uh, kind of bring things up to speed um, in terms of Peru and, and what's going on in South America. Sí, quizás solo para complementar lo que ya. Yes, maybe just to add to what Michael was saying, and welcome, Gustavo, by the way. I believe that the region is undergoing and suffering through the U.S. policy changes because as the international community in a broader sense of the world, word with the U.S., Canada, Europe, Latin American countries work against corruption. Well, that had great impetus up until we were able to. And as I was describing earlier, and then when that policy changed in the United States, I think that that was what initiated the erosion of Sisig and Masig and all the efforts that have been achieved in the fight against corruption, I believe that what we experienced is that in spite of the inroads made by uh, career officials, as Michael mentioned, well, the U.S. support was critical. It was absolutely necessary, imperative. But that change in policy, what it led to was that Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador had to sign the safe country agreement, and that was the only objective, and they achieved that. But, well, I won't talk about the gross abuses that that uh, carries regarding uh, asylum rights and uh, the rights of those that uh, are fleeing from violence and corruption as asylum seekers, but I will focus on how signing these three agreements led to embracing two presidents who were being seriously questioned due to corruption. So Jimmy Morales being one of them, he was facing many charges 
presented by CCIG and the Attorney General's because of his involvement in acts of corruption, just as the higher officials in Honduras due to corruption and drug trafficking, as Michael mentioned. Well, the president's brother, Tony Hernandez, Juan Orlando's brother, according to New York's uh, prosecutors, uh, well, they uh, were charged and uh, connected to the Sinaloa cartel because they provided great sums of uh, money to their campaign. And also in Guatemala, there was a clear link between the President Jimmy Morales with the then uh, candidate uh, for the presidency who is now being tried in New York, Mario Estrada. This was known and demonstrated. So, well, they looked at working on immigration policies that would infringe on human rights. And it reduced our and weakened our fight against corruption in a crucial time, but it also embraced these precedents who were pointed out for being involved in drug trafficking rings. So not only does that remove the, that does not remove the causes for mobilization, but exacerbates them. And so we we're trying to work for the justice system and the rule of law and the fight against drug trafficking because its violence is one of the main reasons for people to emigrate. So going back to your question, Adriana, well, the effects of the White House policies towards the region, these have been disastrous. Thank you, Claudia. Gustavo, welcome. I will ask a very broad question and give you enough time to answer. First, I'd like to commend you for all the work that has been done in fighting corruption in Peru. Well, it's also a country where all living former presidents have been involved in and embroiled in most of the, the corruption scandals. And the current president took office after his previous or his predecessor resigned because of corruption accusations. And he's pursued a very ambitious anti-corruption agenda. So what's the current state of affairs in Peru in terms of uh, its corruption, its uh, efforts against corruption? And uh, looking at the journalistic work being conducted and also how you've been working with the media in Peru in order to shed light on these scandals and the degree of corruption that has been experienced in the country and how these efforts compare to those of other media outlets in other countries. And lastly, given that Michael and Claudia were talking about the impact that this change in policy has had and this weakening bipartisan support from the US in the fight against corruption, well, how has this impact been seen in Peru specifically? Okay. Let's try to unpack this in a concise way. Well, IDL Reporters is a, a dissemination resource and it is a digital media dedicated to investigative journaling or journalism. And we are a conglomerate of media or a cluster of media outlets that have had a swift and noteworthy effect in trying to move forward with investigative journalism, which was greatly threatened recently by traditional media. And what we have been doing, well, it's been uh, akin to what El Faro does in El Salvador. They've done a great job there, also others in Latin America. And we, in terms of the Lavajato case or the car wash case, which is the most well-known public 
private corruption scandal in the last few decades in Latin America because it did not only affect Peru and Brazil, but all of Latin America. One of the things that we did was precisely to create a network of investigative journalists that would be dedicated to monitor this closely. So as journalists, we took on that initiative and this led to us nudging others so that we could get a structured journalists network with La Nación in Argentina from Uruguay, Armando Info from Venezuela, from La Prensa in Panama. So traditional and novel media all together with a common denominator and that is uh, our fight for the truth. And part of the investigations that we've conducted, well, that has led to some fruits with the extradition of uh, Soya, the Pemex executive from Spain to Mexico. That's something that we were able to achieve thanks to our investigation efforts. And then it has led to other cases being uncovered, even though the Peña Nieto government tried to cover it up for years. Now it's possible for us to re that solution. And we, we have yet to see if it's taken to higher instances. And also the lawyer of the uh, soya of the soya official Baltasar Garzon well if we have a long enough life we'll see many other repercussions because right now he is in a private clinic without any access to information so we have yet to see what happens with him but in terms of Latin America and Peru more specifically, what I can say is that thanks to us being able to really make inroads in this investigation, well, there was no way for people to cover it up because this was really determining and steadfast information that uh, was compelling enough that it told them the deep-rooted corruption that uh, then the judiciary and other powers of the nation were able to uncover and this led to some other events that were significant that included a former president being uh, accused and the, also the closing of institutions that uh, were embroiled in corruption and also a new team of investigators, elite investigators from the Attorney General's office came about so that in an unprecedented way, they worked on coming up with deep reforms in the judiciary and in fiscal terms. And almost all former presidents, elected former presidents from 2001 are all involved in this. Alejandro Toledo is awaiting uh, extradition from the U.S. Alberto Fujimori, his predecessor, he's uh, also accused of violations to human rights and corruption. Ollanta Humala will start his, uh, his case. And then uh, we had a suicide of the other president. And then Kuczynski, who was uh, also removed, he was ousted. He is facing an investigation because of a serious conflict of interest due to the Odebrecht scandal when he was a minister under Toledo. So therefore, we have had very significant milestones that have also demonstrated, however, that these are not enough because as we uncover a scandal that shows us there's an endemic corruption that is pervasive and insidiously going through all the institutions, then it means that these are stepping stones.
that need to get to not only the courts, but also a changing in our procedures and culture as a nation. I think that this is possible. I think it's feasible. And we have been seeing that in many countries. Now, the fight against uh, the against corruption here in, in Peru has not been affected significantly by the Trump administration. Well, people have a saying, uh, poor Mexico, so close to God and well, so close to the US and so far from God. Well, I would say that we haven't had pressure to return our migrants or to pay for them. So they have not been a significant actor in that sense. What I must say is that in terms of regional and hemispheric investigations conducted in the Lava Jato case, and even more specifically in Odebrecht, the intervention of the DOJ at a given moment to compel the confessions, the massive confession in exchange of uh, lifting of sanctions. Well, that was very important. In addition to the Swiss authorities' support and the spectacular work conducted by the Forza de Tarefa from Curitiba in Brazil in order to move that forward. Then there are other investigations being conducted, but everything in due time. And the current state of affairs is the following. In Peru, as in most of Latin America, the plague, well, this pandemic has been at the forefront and has put everything else in the back burner. Now, the effect that's had on Peru has been brutal. It has laid waste on our economy. It has set, taken us back at least five, six years and just months. It's caused as many casualties as our war against the Shining Path in just a matter of months. And in the midst of this and in the confusion of not finding the right response, well, we're still in the eye of the storm, in the eye of the hurricane, as we cannot ameliorate the statistics, but uh, we are trying to do our best. I think that in Peru and in Latin America and the rest of the world, it is of the utmost importance to be fully alert and understand the risks that this pandemic is carrying. I think that uh, democracies are already under siege in the world entire. And this additional factor will be severe. And therefore we need to be fully alert and establish the foundation necessary for our democracies to demonstrate that they are the most apt at countering something like COVID-19. Thank you, Gustavo, for this a bit discouraging overview. Um, toward um, the future, um, and Michael, I want to begin with you, uh, you know, looking at um, what ought to be, uh, you know, better U.S. policy moving forward and concretely, you know, if you could address more of what uh, has been the impact of international efforts. Gustavo mentioned the role of DOJ in the case of the investigation um, in the region, um, but what has been the impact of um, the work of the of the EFIs, the Summit of the Americas, which you mentioned, the U.S. investigations, and your thoughts in terms of moving forward and a better approach um, of U.S. policy to address these issues? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Adriana. Saludos, Gustavo. Um, I'll try to uh, try to address both those those pieces. Um, you know, succinctly. Um, 
look, I think I think the the news here is a little more positive. I'll start with the DOJ piece, which Gustavo mentioned. Uh, I, I think FCPA and you know the 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 prosecutions that put the U.S. on the side of Latin Americans uh, and others, uh, but in this case, Latin Americans who resent corruption and are directly or indirectly victimized it, you know, that, that is a kind of an underappreciated source of U.S. soft power. Uh, I think it, um, you know, FCPA gives U.S. prosecutors enormous leverage. We certainly saw that in the, in the Odebrecht case. Uh, and I think we could be doing more both to kind of step up enforcement, but also then, you know, once an FCPA case is, is built and brought to collaborate um, with prosecutors in, in Latin American countries to expose corrupt networks, to provide information and, and help uh, local prosecutors build cases. You know, we've seen some of that uh, in places like Brazil and, and Peru, but, but probably not as much as, um, as we could have had this been kind of more of a, a priority. So, um, you know, that is, I think, both a, a, a kind of continuing bright spot in terms of the, the institutional infrastructure that exists in the U.S. and something that I think should be uh, part of the, the agenda going forward. Um, multilaterally, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the summit was um, positive in the sense that, first of all, it focused on democratic governance against corruption as a theme. I think that that shows you just how much leaders in the region felt like they needed to be responsive to citizens' concerns. There was a consensus declaration of more than 50 commitments uh, on anti-corruption that came out of that. Um, they are necessarily sort of aspirational um, and I think we've seen that the, the kind of follow up and enforcement mechanisms are not as strong as they need to be. So there's there's work to do there. But um, uh, but but certainly, I think, you know, there is space in, in the multilateral context to uh, to continue to kind of push this. Uh, and on the iffies, um, you know, the thing I could speak to, I think, the most directly is the role of the IDB, um, where, uh, you know, I think if you go back a few years, certainly there are critiques of the IDB and other development banks for being so focused on lending that they were overlooking uh, corruption risks and concerns. But um, what I found in recent years is, is I think, a real uh, sensitivity to this issue um, and its impact on development at the IDB. I think you see that in things like the, the debarment of, of Odebrecht and other construction firms. You see it in the deployment of um, uh, a, a, a mapping platform for looking at government expenditures. Um, uh, that even in the context of, of COVID, for example, has been deployed by Paraguay to track and, and provide uh, transparency to government expenses, expenditures. Um, and I think you see this in, in, in kind of on the thought leadership front as well. Um, the expert advisory group that President Moreno convened last year produced what I thought was a, a really kind of stellar distillation of both corruption challenges and, and potential solutions uh, and, and a blueprint for, uh, for, for, for work going forward. Uh, we at the Dialogue have partnered with the IDB to look at things like political finance, comparative uh, corruption prosecutions, and we'll be launching a new project soon that's focused on uh, infrastructure procurement, which obviously has been kind of a vector uh, of corruption in the region and in, in the wake of the, uh, the Odebrecht case. So, um, so I think there's a lot there that's positive. Uh, I, I would just flag the upcoming um, kind of IDB presidential election um, uh, in the context of what we've been talking about in, in the Trump administration, uh, you know, um, I, I think it's critical that the IDB continue to be a regional ally on these issues and um, to have, uh, you know, the leading candidate be uh, a nominee of the Trump administration and somebody who is very, very closely affiliated with uh, a hemispheric policy that has not, um, as we've discussed, uh, necessarily prioritized rule of law and anti-corruption, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a risk, I think. Uh, and I think the questions need to be asked uh, in, in that regard. Um, you know, looking forward, I, I won't dwell on this. We can, you know, we can come back to it, Adriana, if, if, uh, if there's time. But, um, I, you know, I, I do think that the U.S. needs to start by uh, leading by example. I think we need to reinvigorate U.S. international leadership on, on anti-corruption rule of law. Uh, we need to back reformers abroad, whether it's the the CCs of the world or the society leaders and, and, and investigative journalists like Gustavo, um, who are kind of on the front lines of this. And, and then there are a series of kind of US, unique U.S. Uh, tools that can be brought to bear in this fight, uh, whether it's global Magnitsky, whether it's FCPA, whether it's the conditions that we can put on foreign assistance in places like uh, like Central America. So, so there is, um, I think, a, an enormous role that the U.S., can play for good uh, if we're on the right side of these issues. And, and so 
um, you know, a lot more there, I'm sure, to explore. But I'll, I'll stop here in the interest of hearing uh, Claudia and Gustavo. Thank you, Michael. Um, con eso quizás, y para terminar, eh, Claudia y Gustavo. Okay, Claudia and Gustavo, from your perspective, if you had a magic wand, how could the foreign policy in the U.S. take that lead, as Michael said? And if they do, what should be their priorities as they push forward a new policy against the corruption? Well, I can start. I think that currently we are going through a crisis in the region where our efforts against impunity and corruption are at a stalemate and suffering some setbacks. And I think that uh, the politicians accompanying these efforts is uh, vital. So the prosecutors, the judges in Guatemala, and also in Honduras, the National Commission Against Corruption, but also independent journalists, because they are under siege. Gustavo was mentioning El Faro, and then there are others in El Salvador who have been attacked, especially stigmatized, but recently they have suffered robberies and crimes against them. And so anything that can be done through the State Department, the Congress and the Senate to accompany these individuals and their efforts in these three Central American countries, all that would be very important. And I'd say that it's urgent actually. Now looking at it from the medium term, as it was mentioned by Michael, from the DOJ, well, there they have many tools available from joint investigations as those conducted back in the day when I was uh, attorney general. Well, there we would work against uh, drug trafficking, not only against the kingpins, but the entire networks and uh, criminal organizations like the Setas, which operated in Guatemala as uh, working with uh, extradition requests of important leaders in terms of corruption and drug trafficking. And I would not uh, dismiss some other actions that have proven effective in Honduras and Guatemala. These are specific sanctions against people linked to corruption. Something that was mentioned was Gustavo Alejo in Guatemala, but also other important players, for example, family members of President Ortega in Nicaragua, and uh, how some assets have been seized as a result. Well, but with that, I yield the floor to Gustavo. Gustavo, you have two minutes. Well, what can the U.S. do to help us in this fight against corruption? Well, maybe electing a new president, for starters, and wait and hope that the new president understands what it really means to lead morally and practically in a superpower when it comes to these matters, because democratic governments even though they lack Trump's record, unfortunate record, what they've had are different uh, positions where you can uh, see a certain level of hypocrisy, where they support some values, but that is not accompanied by actions in uh, terms of uh, pressure against businesses and bilateral actions or bipartisan actions. Well, I'm almost out of time, but I'd say that is all. And in the case that we have a new 
democratic president with clear ideas moving forward and understanding that one of their main tasks at hand is to work against this setback in democracies, not only in the hemisphere, but in the world entire and demonstrate to the whole world that democracies are what we need in order to bring about better well-being when we apply pragmatic solutions to these problems. Because uh, if we only focus on uh, some subjects and not these overriding subjects, they may fail. In Latin America, well, as Michael uh, said, well, hopefully they can expand their mapping and records at the IDB and other institutions. It's happened, but uh, more informally. So hopefully, as much as possible, we can get back to efforts like CSIG because the dissolution of the CSIG was an enormous setback. And understanding that uh, there is a reactionary right wing that enjoys popular support that it didn't enjoy in the, in the past in Latin America. Well, they are working on so only some areas and these have pervaded uh, Peru in Central America, Central America and Brazil. And they are in synchrony with the, the other ultra right groups that include even the Catholic Church. And they have joint actions taking place and they're using disinformation to discredit those who are working in these investigations. All of us in this effort have had to sustain these attacks, but also they have led to people supporting that effort instead of our older values. And uh, President Bukele in El Salvador, for example, has uh, launched a whole offensive against El Faro and appealed to complete slander against them. In Panama, well, they have foreign pre or former presidents, Valladares and Martinelli, have come together to accuse La Prensa and were able to seize and freeze their banking accounts in order to be able to stop this uh, newspaper from operating. And the same has happened in other countries. So this support against uh, corruption needs all our wherewithals, some that have not been mentioned here, but it's also very important to have support to democratic governance and the growth of this democracies, helping all mechanisms that may lead to democracy becoming the most effective system for progress and for the people. A democracy built on societies that are polarized and that are unequal in terms of the economy and that this is even more obvious now with the pandemic. Well, these are democracies that will always need to work on these inherent weaknesses before their eventual collapse. So all this is very important. I think I'm, I'm sorry, I think I went over my two minutes. It's for hours, um, but uh, I've been told that we've reached uh, our time limit. Um, I mean, it is clear as you have highlighted that um, this is a perennial and as you described, Michael, endemic systemic issue, uh, very clear that it has, been, it's an ongoing 
challenge that has been building for decades, um, as Gustavo and Claudia described, uh, with various factors, um, various causes, uh, but devastating consequences, uh, as you all have described, for the economies, uh, for the capacity of the governments to address the needs of their citizenry, and for democracy, as Gustavo just underscored, particularly now, you know, in the time of, of the pandemic and the, and the um, impact that we're seeing of the pandemic across the region and need for greater accountability and transparency as to how the governments are addressing the pandemic. Um, as you, you know, we started off talking about the progress uh, that had been made several years ago um, across the region in Central America with the support work of the MOXI, uh, the CC, um, the investigations, the role of journalism in Peru and in other countries. Um, but how, you know, we started, we're starting to see a backlash. Um, and as you pointed out, Michael, you know, there are different factors, but including um, also, you know, that resilience that we see from uh, corrupt networks. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the power the, of, of the status quo of uh, different uh, sectors that have allied uh, to push back against these important efforts. And, you know, the role um, of the Trump administration, um, where we had seen very strong um, bipartisan support, but, you know, with that selectivity, uh, reprioritization and other issues that you mentioned, Claudia mentioned, that had um, devastating impact in some cases, like the case of Central America, where we saw the demise of very important efforts. Uh, but you also mentioned a very important point, Michael, and that is the, the damage to the credibility of the U.S. Um, and the role that it had been playing in supporting anti-corruption um, um, efforts globally. Um, you meant, but you know, everybody mentioned um, key factors in terms of moving forward, including the use of soft power, the role that the IFIs and international bodies can play, how we can strengthen those efforts, um, how the U.S. needs to lead by example, uh, reinvigorate the support, um, and uh, you know, and address the attacks against democracy, against the rule of law uh, that Gustavo um, highlighted but also support those that are leading the efforts, that continue to lead the efforts. As Claudia mentioned, you know, you have very brave prosecutors and judges that continue to uh, uh, move forward, very important cases. The amazing work of investigative journalism that as you both highlighted, Gustavo and Claudia have come under attack and civil society and the tools that the US has at its disposal um, to be able to support these anti-corruption efforts and be able to address this backlash that we're seeing against democracy and the rule of law. I'm sure we can continue unpacking all of this, but I wanted to thank uh, the three of you. Gracias, Claudia, Gustavo, Michael. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. And just to remind everybody that we have uh, the third event of our series next Wednesday um, that is going to look um, at the threats to democratic norms and the closing of civic spaces um, in Latin America. So please RSVP for that. Um, and with that, I want to bring our event to a close. Thank Good you. Goodbye. Ciao.